When I was at the seminary, one of my favorite professors was Dr. Arthur Just. He wrote the commentary on Luke, some books on the liturgy, and even did a video series back in the 90s on the liturgy of the Lutheran Church and the history of it. Beautiful stuff. And he would always say that the purpose of the Son of God becoming man, the purpose of the incarnation, everything about Jesus, was God making right that which has gone wrong. Now, I remember one time at Gamutnikite, which is when all of us would gather in the commons around a few kegs and drink for a few hours until all the beer was gone. We were talking, and I said, you know, that sheds so much light on the miracles. That you have the Word making right that which has gone wrong, giving life in the midst of Lazarus' death. Water turned into wine that they may have more than needed. 5,000 fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. Or as we see in our text today, a leper healed and a cripple given the gift of movement. Making right that which has gone wrong. For Jesus came and the leper came to him and said, Lord, if you will it, you can make me clean. And what does Jesus do? He touches him and says, I will be ye cleansed. And the man is healed, cleansed of his leprosy because leprosy is wrong. Not icky or anything like that. I don't mean that, even though it is. It is wrong, meaning it is not what God has created the body to be. Leprosy deteriorates and eats away at the body. And God does not create that. He does not make that right thing, but it is a wrong thing, a consequence of the fall into sin. And Jesus, by speaking and touching, has made right this man's body. And from there, Christ continued his work of making right that which had gone wrong because of sin. Making right first faith in the centurion because this centurion, he shouldn't exist. No unbeliever should exist at all. Because unbelief is a consequence of the fall. Doubt and skepticism. Other religions, because all those other religions, it's not like those gods don't exist. Don't ever say something dumb like that. Don't ever say Zeus or Mars. Oh no, that's Jupiter, right? Zeus was Jupiter. I always get the Romans and the Greeks. It's always fun time. Don't say they aren't real. They are. They're just demons. Why would you say these things aren't real? That's foolish. All these things are real. They're just demonic, meant to guide you away from the one true God. But there is one God over them. And yet this centurion comes to Christ, and he doesn't come to Christ by his own reason or strength, but he comes because he has heard. As we hear in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ, because only faith could say what this centurion said. I am not worthy for you to enter under my roof, but speak only your word. Say it, and it shall be thus. And Jesus spoke. After making right that which had gone wrong with the centurion, now making right that which had gone wrong with the paralyzed servant, because God does not desire paralyzed bodies. Now, this isn't saying, oh, pastor doesn't like crippled people. Pastor is saying people who have, um, what are they, like, that don't move, shouldn't be in church. That's what, no, I'm not saying that. Don't be dumb. Good heavens. I love that. I can't wait for a meeting with my elder this week. Pastor, you said you don't like people who have hip injuries. No, not what I'm saying. But this is what I'm saying is, in the resurrection of the body on the last day, are there going to be people whose bodies don't work? Yes or no? No, everyone's going to walk. Everyone's going to run. Everyone's going to skip. Everyone's going to jump. Everyone's going to be going everywhere because that's what the body does. Wrong is that the body falls apart. Some of us, it happens when we're younger. Some of us, it finally happens on our deathbed. But the body falls apart and is paralyzed. It's wrong. But Jesus, at his word, makes it right. For all of this, the healing of the leper, the healing of the paralyzed man, and giving him the gift of movement is all on the way to the cross. Because that's the fun part about the Gospels. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how big are the passions of Jesus? The death of Jesus. Is it five chapters? 
Seven chapters? No, it's like a chapter at best. Most texts, the death of Jesus is only about 20 verses. That's not what it's all about. The entire gospel is the passion of Christ because you only understand what Jesus is doing in the context of where he is going. Making right that which had gone wrong on the way to the cross. So that he may take all that is wrong with you and me and everyone in between who have a wrong relationship with the Father and make us right with God. That we may stand before him now, humble, but welcome. For none of us have the right to be at the table. None of us have the right to even be at this table today. <laughs> We've been acting a fool this week. <laughs> We've been so sinful this week. All of us have gone out as if God didn't matter, as if we mattered most. I'm right. You're wrong. It's this person, not me. The anger has justifications. The lust has its way. All of us have done enough this week not to merit a place at the table. We have no right to kneel here and eat the body and drink the blood of Christ. Just as we have no right to stand in the presence of the Father, head held high, saying, I deserve to be here. That was the Israelites. Those are the ones that get the weeping and gnashing of teeth. No. Every time before I receive the body and blood of Christ here at the table, I pray the prayer of the centurion. Lord, I am not worthy for you to enter under my roof, but speak only your word and your servant shall be healed. I'm not worthy to have it. You aren't worthy to have it. And yet, you're welcomed here. Welcome not based on merit, because only a fool would show up to a party to which he was not invited. You're welcomed in Christ, invited in his blood and dwell here in the forgiveness he won for you. Making right that which has gone wrong. Not the sinner anymore. That is not who you are in the eyes of the Father, but a saint, right and holy. And now, because that is who you are, because that wrongness of sin has been made right, meaning you have been made right in the blood of Christ. Death is no more for you. Death determines everything in this world. Look at what we did two years ago. We literally shut down church because of death. I did it. I can look back at myself two years ago. Oh, we didn't know the numbers. We didn't know this. We did it for this. No, I did it because I was scared to die and I was scared for someone else to die. That's why I did it. We were scared of death. As a Christian, death is nothing. Death is gone. Death is obliterated. Death is destroyed by Christ. Death. He has overcome death. He has obliterated it. There is no more death for you who are in Christ because you are forgiven. And the wages of sin is death. And there's no more sin in you. Therefore, there is no more death for you. You are freed from it. Gone is death for you. It is now a portal to life immortal for you. That is what death is. Keep acting like the world with it. It means you're still clinging to that sin. No. You are forgiven. Death is defeated. And that's who you and I are. Made right in the blood of Christ. Sin and death done. And now we abide in this world. This wrong world. This world filled with stench and wickedness and filth. But we've been made right by Christ. I was talking to a buddy of mine. He's a professor of dogmatics, which is just a fancy word for doctrinal theology. And we were talking about what would be great for the life of a church. I said, wouldn't it be awesome if every day my emails weren't filled with nitpicky things, but just questions about Scripture? Wouldn't it be great if the text messages I get are this or this, but questions about doctrine. Wouldn't it be great if we spent five hours in a voters meeting telling each other how much we love each other? Wouldn't that be awesome? Because that's what you and I have for each other. Burn in love, baby. 
burning, sacrificial love. No John Lennon junk here of imagining no heaven and no hell, but Elvis-style love in which we tell each other every day, I love you. Even though you may be faulty today, I love you. Because guess what? We say there isn't a perfect church. Yes, there is. There is one. To say it won't be there until Jesus comes back is a cop-out. It's selfish. It's lazy. Because we always say, if I could find the perfect church, well, if Mark just left, man, it'd be a perfect church. Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Mark can take it. I love it. You know, maybe, maybe if we had a different organist than Linnea, life would be great at this church. Don't worry, Linnea. It's good. Maybe if Pastor Hall left, God, I like the guy before him better, or I want another guy after him, or I like the guy 35. How, how long is Pastor Tyke Miller here? I can't bash too many years. I'll go 60 years ago. He wasn't here 60 years ago. We'll do that. But I like that guy better. No, who's the problem with all this in every equation? It's you. Me. You know why there's no perfect church? Because you refuse to believe you're the cause of the imperfection. There can be a perfect church, and there is one in Christ. Where else are you going to get absolute forgiveness and love? Where else are you going to get this? Nowhere. And if we squander it, trying to be worldly, then God will take it away from you. And say, maybe one day you'll realize how good it is. Maybe you'll get it before you die. But Christ still speaks to you. He speaks to you into the wrongness of your existence and says, be at peace. I will it. You are clean. You are perfect. You are forgiven. You are holy. You are righteous. Because now my voice is the only one that matters, says Jesus. The devil's voice doesn't matter. His voice is silence. He is muted. He can sit in the corner and mumble all he wants, but he has no place here anymore. Only the voice of Christ who says, I love you. I forgive you. And I've gone to prepare a place for you. Making right that which has gone wrong. A couple years ago, I was doing dishes downstairs. This was December 23rd, I remember, because I was all stressed about Christmas. I don't know why. It comes and goes every year, even if I'm not around. Thanks be to God. But I remember I was stressing out, doing some dishes, getting things ready. Allison and Lonnie were helping get Amy ready for bed because there's a routine. And we had Ty and Manny and Jamie upstairs in the bedroom. Have you ever noticed, if you have boys, that somehow bedtime sounds like WWF? You know, it sounds like Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Royer are going at it upstairs and Andre the Giant shows up with Hacksaw Jim Doug. You know, it just sounds, that's what it sounds like. So I have learned to ignore the yelling and the thunder and all that upstairs. But then I heard that sound no parent desires to hear. It's that blood-curdling scream that isn't the cause of a leg drop. But seeing Jamie run down the stairs with blood all over his hand. And me thinking, oh, it's just a cut on his hand. No, lift up the hair and psh, it comes out. Because he tried to be Spider-Man and jump off his top bunk. And he landed on an essential oil diffuser. So if anyone says essential oils help, at least with my son, it didn't. Linnea says she's suing me after the service for that, for slander. But I remember we got the blood stopped because Alice and I remained calm, cool as cucumbers during it. You know, I love you. You're a great dad. You're a great mom. Let's just care for our child. And we took him to the ER. And at the ER, we got him cleaned up. We got him sewn up. They gave him a popsicle and said, hey, for two weeks, you are untouchable. And he's like, ha take this home. And so my brothers. But we didn't take him to the hospital, to the ER, to have them tell us about what it means to sew someone up. We didn't take them to the hospital for them to tell us what it means to clean an infection. We didn't take them to the hospital to learn a lesson on home safety. We took them to the hospital to be sewn up and clean so he could be healed. And that's why the Holy Spirit has brought you here today. Not to hear about something, but to actually be healed. For the real Jesus cleansed the real leper of his real leprosy. And Jesus gave that real paralyzed man the gift of really moving. And he gave the centurion real faith that trusts in a real Savior who has made for him a real heaven and a real table to feast at unto the ages. And Jesus is your real Savior. 
that this day truly forgives me, that this day truly loves me, who has given a real life for yours, that you may have in the midst of everything that's wrong, something that's right, eternal life with your Father. In Jesus' name, amen.